Welcome everyone, this is your host Rudolf Barashic back again with another episode and I have my special guest back on, Jeffrey Newquist. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Great. So we had a very interesting discussion last time, it was a little bit heated about uh, Israel and the killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general, which was direct, which was orchestrated by the United States and sanctioned by President Donald Trump. So uh, for today, we're going to focus a little bit more about the recent events uh, that has happened. Like we, we have this with Vladimir Putin when he has somehow resorted to historical revisionism by by claiming that Poland was not a victim, it was actually an aggressor. So the Soviet Union in collaboration with the National Socialist Germany at that time, well, they somehow committed a preemptive strike against Poland. So that's what he, he, he is making this claim. And actually it has raised concern or rather shockwaves all over the world. What would you say about this? <clears throat> well, I, I studied Putin's statement. It, and it's interesting. It was made in a gathering at St. Petersburg of former officials of former Soviet states. Um, and he made this bizarre comment about Colonel Beck who was the Polish foreign minister in 1939 and before. And what he said is he called, he, he claimed that Colonel Beck really loved Hitler's idea of exporting the Jews of Europe to Africa. And he uh, supposedly, Colonel Beck said, well, if you do that, we'll make some kind of monument to you, you know. And so then uh, Putin claimed that Colonel Beck was an anti-Semitic pig which was kind of a startling thing to hear from the lips of a Russian president uh, calling a statesman of an earlier era uh, an anti-Semitic pig. Now, maybe it's true. I don't know what, I don't know that much about Beck. I've, I, you know, I've read things that Beck has written and I've read about Beck, but this is, this was new to me. I had never heard of this story. Have you heard of this story? No, no, I have not. It's but, very but, but, strange. But, the, but to, to be more specific, what he said about the start of the war is he blamed the Allies and said that they unleashed Hitler at Munich by appeasing Hitler, and therefore it was their fault, and that Russia had no choice but to do the pact with Germany. Exactly. The, they uh, squeeze, yeah. they squeeze in the corner and had no choice. Right. So, so he's making all those excuses for... <laughs> For, um, for the Soviet yeah. Union. It's now, I understand that the Polish government is struck back, and the Polish government, of course, has pointed out that um, the Soviet government was, you know, Putin made the statement that they they had to, to cooperate with Hitler for humanitarian, they had to invade Poland to save Jews <laughs> for humanitarian reasons. Mm -hmm. But uh, as the Polish government shot back and, and gave documented evidence of Jews numbers of Jews that were handed over by the Soviet government to the Nazis. Exactly. Um, but but, is, what, yeah, he, but interesting. What, what, he, what he also said what was, uh, was interesting is that Putin also, because it was a gathering, let's say yesterday, in Jerusalem uh, for the, the, to commemorate the, the Holocaust for what happened 75 years ago now. And many mm -hmm. people would gather in Jerusalem. You had like Mike Pence, you had Vladimir Putin, Emmanuel Macron, Prince Charles in the UK, and so on. So you have many elitist people gathering in Jerusalem and so on to talk about it. And what Putin said, this is also must be taken into consideration. He said that also the people where the concentration camps were installed, where they are culpable as well. They're not victim, putting uh, again the blame like on the on the on the poles, basically. Yeah, that is outrageous. That is mm. totally outrageous. Yeah. But if 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 we go back a little bit in history, what, what is quite interesting as well is that during the socialist bloc, the poles, they also when the Second World War ended, it was. All of these socialist regimes, along with the Western powers and so on, they all put the blame. They all put the blame on on Germany because it was very convenient to do so at that time. Germany was occupied. It was the it was totally ripped apart. 
by by the Soviet Union and the Western powers and so on. And then all of a sudden, Germany was to blame for everything that happened. But now we notice that Putin, he has made a, a very special turn in politics by putting the blame on, on the Poles. And the Poles, they have remained quiet up until now. What would you say? Well, actually, Poland, this dispute goes back further because Poland called upon the European uh, Union to vote for, I believe it's the European Parliament was the body, to, uh, to actually have a vote on Russian war, you know, Russia sh or Soviet Union sharing the blame for starting World War II with Germany. Um, because, uh, and, I, and this was, you know, obviously Putin was in part reacting to this, that, hey, if we're going to really have an accurate uh, depiction of blame in World War II. Look, the country that was invaded and partitioned was Poland, and it wasn't Germany that invaded Poland by itself. The Germany invaded it with the Soviet Union. Um, and so if that was the blameworthy act that started the war, then the Russians bear blame because Hitler, I don't think, would have invaded Poland if he hadn't had Stalin as a partner to invade it with. Um, I, I think that the fact that, for example, if you look at the history of it, when Hitler was was preparing to invade Poland and Mussolini backed out and said, I'm not going to support you, Hitler himself was seemed to be backing away from it. Um, yes, but we, yeah, because Hitler did not want to, he, he tried to avoid it at all costs the war with Poland. We, we know this, yes. But 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 yeah, I mean, well, I you know, it's a very it's a very complicated. I mean, if, if people want to know the details, they could read the origins of the Second World War by um, the British historian um, whose name now eludes me, um, Taylor, A. J. P. Taylor. He's a he's a British guy who wrote a, a famous uh, biography of Bismarck and was sort of an expert on German diplomatic history. Um, and it's a, it's by the way, it's a very, it's not as a straightforward. The diplomatic background is not as quite as straightforward as you might think. It's quite a complicated thing, but because obviously you have you have, you know, large amounts of German territory sitting in other people's countries, and uh, the the First World War. This is the legacy of the First World War and the Versailles Treaty, which itself is a mess. You know, a terrible mess. Um, and it's not to say that Hitler was uh, some kind of angel or something. He wasn't. Uh, but, you know, you got you got the Soviet Union there ready to make trouble and play its divide and conquer game, which look at how it turned out. If you read Viktor Suvorov's uh, Icebreaker, he points out that Stalin and Lenin had conceived of this idea of a Second World War in which they got the Western powers to fight each other. And the Soviet Union would come in and clean up afterwards. And that is exactly what it looks like they tried to carry out, as, but, but, as, which but, is what Suvorov points out. Yeah. But 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 what makes it all bizarre with with uh, with Putin's statements and so on is that, it, I mean, why would, I mean, if if both the Soviet Union, along let's say with the Germans, they go and partition Poland, why would the Western powers you know, declare war on Germany and just give the Soviets a free pass. It, it well, just doesn't... Is, the, there's a good reason for it. And it's described by Suvorov like this. You have Germany, Germany agrees to partition Poland with the Soviet Union, okay? You Soviets, you get your army ready to invade, we get our army ready to invade. And so September 1st comes, the German army invades, because after all, the, the fall rains are coming, and you've got to get this over with before the rain falls, right? You've got, you've got a time-sensitive thing here. So the Germans go, and the Soviets, all of a sudden, Hitler looks, it's the second, it's the third. Now the France and Britain are declaring war because they've said they would declare war on Germany if it invaded Poland. And, and, but Hitler's going, where are the Russian troops? Where are the Soviet troops? And, and, of course, he asks the Soviets, why aren't you invading and Stalin says, well, there's been delays. We have trouble moving our troops up to the frontier. It's going to be a few more days. Uh, so all of a sudden, Hitler finds himself out front getting declared war on. Stalin's hanging back going, oh, I'm sorry. I can't join you right away. Then on the 17th of September, the Soviets invade. So then the Allies are confronted with the problem. 
do they, does France and Germany declare war on the Soviet Union and Germany, which would be kind of suicide for them, right? Because they'd be, well, <laughs> they would my, really my, be in, the, in, the, in, a, in a difficult position because the Soviet Union and Germany together, you know, there would be no part of the Eurasian landmass they could hold on to if they were up against that combination. So they didn't. They didn't declare war on the Soviet Union out of a kind of uh, common sense of, well, maybe we better not take on that you know, both of those countries at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, well I would like to say that uh, I believe that we have to go prior to this. I don't believe that this happened 1939. I believe that even, let's say, since 1933, when you have these anti-Nazi boycotts, which was Jewish-led international boycott of German products and so on in response to the German atrocities and so on, already then started the mobilization from the lobbying forces and so on to, to, to simply, let's say, demonize Germany. And I'm not, I'm not defending Germany in any sort of way for what it did in Poland or afterwards, anything like that. But I want to keep it in an objective way and so on. And I, I believe that there was actually a mobilization against Germany prior to 1939 because the Soviet Union, after the Civil War, uh, had a free pass, basically could do whatever they want. Nobody. Well, you know that uh, after Munich, uh, Halifax, the uh, foreign minister of the United Kingdom, and um, Neville Chamberlain, I believe, visited Rome to see Mussolini in January 1939. And I'm I'm going by memory now, but uh, they were really putting pressure on Mussolini not to not to follow through on his alliance with Hitler, and so it was uh, pretty clear at that point that Germany and um, Germany uh, was being surrounded and was being pressured by Britain and France. That there had been a decision had been made after Munich by the British and the French leadership that Hitler had to be removed from power, sort of a regime change had to happen, and that they were going to use what means were available to contain Hitler, sort of like we were containing Saddam Hussein, and there was that kind of a thing was going on. So yes, before 1939, I think definitely a decision had been made, and I, I think that perhaps the Kristallnacht didn't make things any easier for Hitler. Um, the, the, the perception of Germany as, as persecuting Jews in, this, uh, in, a fairly, in a very brutal way. Um, I think also the, 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 uh, what really, though, I think broke the camel's back was the, uh, his annexation of uh, Moravia and Bohemia, the, the rump of the Czech state which was they, they had assumed was something that... But Jeff, did uh, you see, I mean, if you browse back in time, you see all those huge protests taking place in New York, Chicago, you know, everywhere. Oh, yes, well, of course, because Hitler was anti, uh, an anti-Semite, of, uh, of course, course the of Jews course. were very upset, of course, yeah. If, if you see, yes, so, so, so you see a mobilization, basically. And, and, but, but, but what becomes even more complicated in this is that if we look at the events, what happened now, now, if we tie this into, let's say, contemporary, in our contemporary era that we live in now, what is Putin doing? Well, obviously, he's, 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 he's trying to uh, somehow justify the Soviet invasion of Poland and what Soviet, that Soviet army did. And, and this is, and this is, somehow very frightening because it, 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 previously when I discussed I also mentioned to you that in in Israel in the coastal sea of Netanya they have a huge memorial for instance for the Soviet how the Soviets uh, uh, liberated and so on Europe from the Nazi occupiers and everything like that so and also if you tie this with Putin's speech when he was in, in Jerusalem, commemorating the, the Holocaust and so on, and, and promised to, that he will do everything he can to, to go against any sort of anti-Semitic, let's say, <laughs> anyone going, being very anti-Semitic and, and, and being, resorting to historical revisionism in, in that sense. But then again, if you do, so if you are a historical revisionist, in, if you want to do it in a pro-German way well then it's a criminalized behavior but then for a statesman to simply to, to simply change 
<laughs> change history, then it's perfectly legitimate to do so for a state that was definitely an aggressor. Yeah, Any thoughts well, it's, on it's, it's even, well, the, 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 the Russians get into real trouble when they lie like they do. I mean, we'll look at this from another point of view. Not only is Putin sitting there making philo-Semitic statements in Jerusalem, but he's the longtime supporter of the Syrian regime who hate the Jews and hate Israel. He has kept Assad in power, and he's also the main supplier of arms and weaponry and, and even atomic uh, science to Iran. So it's like, wait a minute, he's a philo-Semite and he's supporting the biggest anti-Jewish forces on the planet. Well, well, I how, don't. You know, I, I don't. I don't believe actually that Putin is uh, that the Rush that the so the Russian and previous to that the Soviets, they always maintained maintained good. Let's say, let's put it this way, it becomes very special because naturally Putin has always maintained good ties with Israel. He has never yeah done anything to harm israel in that sense they have always cooperated oh quite all the good. missiles and all the things he's yeah, given uh, around in syria of course of course he has given right. of course he has done so but he has done so in order to position Rus russia as the new broker in the middle east and the israelis well they have never had any quarrels with putin putin was even awarded the man of the year let's say in 2015 in in israel and don't tell me that the israelis are stupid people they're they're like jordan peterson say they're so smart so they would surely understand if he's such an anti if he's supporting all those rogue states that are so anti-semitic and they wants to obliterate israel from the face of the earth so i don't i don't buy that 100 percent but, well, but I let do, me let me tell you what i think about it Mr. Putin is playing both ends against the middle. So when he goes to Tehran, he goes, I'm really on your side. When he goes to Jerusalem, he says, I'm really on your side. But the reality is Putin no, is on his side. Putin is on the side of the Russians. He's not on the side of either side in this thing. No, He's but the Israelis are not stupid. Most... Jeff, Israelis are not stupid. They're you know, very everybody is stupid when they, when they wish no, for that, something that... to be true. Everybody mm, has the... a certain wish for something to be true. Mm. And you will see when it deals with the Russians, the Russians are very good at telling people what they want to hear. And, and furthermore, furthermore, it was the Soviet Union that, that granted juridical status to the state of Israel even prior to the United States. So there is a good, there is a sound tradition going back in time, even during Stalin's time that they were very keen on giving the, and also supply the young state of Israel with weaponry and war material. So, so, yeah, so but in 1973, it was Russian tanks and uh, of course, MiG fighters not... that broke the Bar Lev line. Absolutely. But, but you have to take into consideration, why would they supply the young Jewish state with war material in 1948? Uh, of course, and I'm not saying because that they did not. Because in 1948, they thought that the Jewish state was going to become a socialist bridgehead in the Middle East. Mm. Well, yes, and ben David Ben-Gurion and many people, the Zionist movement is in itself also a socialist movement reserved yes. for the Jews. It has yes. socialist traditions. But, right. but and, and by the way, and now Israel is full of Russians. Israel has a huge Russian population mm. now. I mean, it's, it's, Israel is being infiltrated by Russians. I mean, you don't even need a visa to travel from Moscow to Tel Aviv. You could just get on a plane and yeah, go. Yeah, but it's, they're Russian Jews. They're not Russian Christians. Uh, I beg to differ. Anybody can claim, you know, people can claim it's they're Jews. It's not true. No, you cannot. I know, you, I you, know Russians who no, are but you Jews cannot get Israeli that citizenship. are living it's in based, Israel as Jews it, right now. Yeah, I know yeah, Russians it, who've done yeah, but it. It's, it. It's based on bloodline, Jeff. If you want to become an Israeli citizen, you cannot just, it goes through bloodline. It, yeah, it, but for you instance, can create documentation claiming you have a bloodline when you don't. So the Israelis, they don't have any checks and balances who is entering their country well, and so on. I think about of course how, they do. Think about, think about how infiltrated Israel must be by, by the Russian services. Think about how it must be that how vulnerable that country well, I is. I don't believe so. I think that uh, I don't I don't buy it. I, if you look at the composition of the Soviet Union, how, do, how it was composed, 
from 1917, let's say, or let's look at 1941, you had over 38% in the upper echelons of the Soviet society consisting of people of Jewish descent. Uh, so what, in, the, what, in recent years? No, but in 1941 in the Soviet Union. And if you look at, okay, that, that was 1941. But if you look at also, let's say in recent years, 25% of the billionaires are of Jewish descent living in Russia. So, and they are also invested in Israel. So, so, so there is a, a, naturally a connection with the upper echelons of the Russian society and also with Israel. But, but, but I understand what you're saying and it's a, a game of real politique. The Russians, they are interested in positioning themselves as the new power broker, ba mainly going against the United States because they see that the United States is on their turf causing huge problems. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and, and then also we have to see in, with this, let's say, I'm not only concerned about Putin here. You have people like Mike Pence. You have that gathering of world readers. Mm -hmm. All of them are so concerned for this upsurge of anti-Semitic violence sweeping out, let's say, in Western Europe and so on. And this is, causing a huge concern. And on top of that, Benjamin Netanyahu said, oh, all of the world leaders, we have to go together, go against the most anti-Semitic state on the face of the earth, and it's the state of Iran. What would you say about that? Hmm. I mean, the most anti-Semitic state, um, it could be the most anti-Semitic state, but of course, um, it's kind of it's kind of an interesting thing because how much I mean, obviously, the United States is you know tangled with Iran now uh, very strongly, mm -hmm. but but uh, how what how would you fit Russia into that? I mean, Russia is not cutting off is not going to cut off Iran's uh, uh, military supplies, or do you think that Iran is about to be cut loose by the Russians? Are they going to abandon it? I think, I think if we see it like this, is that if Iran is not able to, let's say, restrain itself, if it, if if somehow it would attack Riyadh or any neighboring country, or if it would do something like that, I think it would present them a, a golden opportunity just to abandon. I think the Russians, they don't feel that they want to go through ahead and support the uh, Iranians. And I believe that the only reason that they entered Syria in the first place, it's, it was not like people say, oh, they went in to, to, to just to do, to, to, let's say, to harbor the Christians that were being beheaded by us. It's simply not true. They went in to position themselves. Look, we are the new broker here. You have to negotiate with us. And we are the new sheriff in town and you have to invite us to. Even, even if you look at how it was, there was a conference also in June 2019, if I remember correctly. It was in Jerusalem. And the, the parties involved were, it was between Israel and and uh, United States and Russia, and that would give you a signal of who is dominating the mid Mid East and how did they want to divide it, and and for the for the Israel sake, what they're doing, well, they try to balance each side against each other in order to maximize their their interest as much as they possibly can. But it, but Russia doesn't have a foothold in the Middle East without Syria and Iran. And Syria and Iran are inextricably tied as allies. I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that, no, no, that Russia's no, no. in—I mean, Russia's supporting Iran in Syria very much. I don't really see how they could possibly be really on the side of the Israelis in, in that regard. But what I would say is that again, Russia is. But they—they they are, they are acting as a balancer. They're well, Russia's as... playing both sides against the middle to gain the greatest benefit for Russia. And right? the same is the United States too. It's a great power. Well, it's no, it, only a... if the United States were 
we're actually playing for the United States. The United States does so many stupid things. You have to wonder whose interests they're really. Oh yes, 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 yes. But if you look at the grand strategy of a, it, just inherited everything from the from Pax Britannica, from the British Empire. So that's why its geopolitical positioning. It had to act as an offshore balancer. In, in to in order to control everything that is happening in the Middle East, it, it inherited these problems. And Russia, yeah. naturally, when it was very weak during the Yeltsin era, did not have the capability to do so. But the opportunity to do so is now perfect. But 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 what I would say, and many alt writers, and and let's say the far right and so on, they have mm. they cheered on Putin. They believe, oh, Putin is great. He is, but he has not done. He he he. he he had the possibility to go much, much harder against Israel, and he could also have gone much, much harder against many of the billionaires that are connected to Israel and so on. And he, 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 he is not, he does not have to, let's say, pay lip service to the state of Israel or to Benjamin Netanyahu, I would say. Well, you just had the killing of Soleimani. Mm -hmm. You have the Samson option by Israel. The Israelis hold the Russians responsible if a nuclear weapon goes off in Tel Aviv and it's sent by the Iranians. Uh, I think that obviously, the, you know, and we've been through this before, there's additional information about the, the uh, resignation of the Russian government last week. Uh, we found that uh, very curiously in the Russian National Security Council, uh, the former prime minister, Medvedev, Dmitry Medvedev, is somehow still the number two man in the Security Council, where the, pri the new prime minister is supposed to be, but he's not, which indicates that the change in government is not what, it, what it's supposed to be. So in, the, in many respects, the, the Security Council in Russia is more important than the cabinet in terms of national security decisions, certainly which means that it very well could be that Russia's senior leadership is being put into a safe place while new leaders are being brought up in the interim in the event that this thing, this thing escalates. That, and, and to me, what this says is the Iranians are so angry and so pushed to the wall by the killing of Soleimani and by the, uh, block, you know, the blockade against them that they are prepared to lash out in a very large way not, you know, the, the biggest way they could lash out is an EMP strike against the U.S. with a Scud missile launched from a freighter off the coast. I think my friend Peter Pry has mentioned that possibility. They could also uh, use a cruise missile from a freighter against Washington during the State of the Union address, God forbid. Uh, I can't believe we're holding the State of the Union um, on February 4th in Washington. It should be held further from the coast. Yes. Um, well, well, but this is, yeah. these are the event. No, you talk about America being stupid in Washington. This is the word on the ground. The Iranians blinked, right? We 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 humiliated them. We backed them down, and they blinked. I don't think well, they blinked. And by the way, these Russian moves, kissing up to Israel, and putting their leadership underground, shows the Russians are scared. The Russians have the sense to be scared of the of the blowback from what could happen now. Because this is a very serious crisis. It could, it could escalate don't, out of control. I don't believe that the Russians are, are scared of a tiny state like Israel or anything like that. But, but, but okay, well, let no, me they're just... They're scared of a nuclear missile from Israel striking Moscow. That's what they're scared of. Well, okay, but what, what I believe is the reason is that Iran, Syria... They're just pieces, pieces of a much of a, of a, of a puzzle. It's just an opportunity for the great powers to enter into a region like the Middle East and divide it. You have like the United States, they have done so, let's say, well, since the, when they toppled Saddam Hussein and went into there. And then you had also when Russia got much stronger and together with Ch Chinese, they're just want, they just want to control these territories. And Israel, I believe, is not a victim. Israel is totally on board and they just see it as a possibility that they can cooperate with the United States and then could cooperate with the Chinese and they could cooperate with the Russians as well. That's the way the way I see it. And it's pointing well, when you're this a, when direction. you're a small country, when you're a small country, you have to play that kind of game, don't you? Oh, that's one dimension. 
like you right. said, it's a small country, but recently you said that it's also that Moscow is afraid of a nuclear retaliation. Well, well, it's so it's a, a small country, country with a nuclear with... weapon. And okay. if, if if the Iranians should bomb Tel Aviv, the, mm. the Israelis have already promised that they would be sending nukes in Russia's direction. So obviously Russia's taking precautions. So but, my point yeah. is not that the Israel is too small or too big. My point is that mm. the places the the Russians are very very concerned that this is going to blow up, that this region's going to blow up and it, it could get into a, a much larger conflict and they don't want to suffer a decapitation mm. of uh, their the, leadership. Uh, yeah. The Samson option, it was not only directed towards, towards the, the, the Russia, it was that if we are attacked, we'll, we'll try to take everyone down as well. Yeah. So it was, well, it was an all-out threat, not only to the Russians. Well, well, don't, but, well, don't, well, don't expect that the Russians will put our leaders underground. <laughs> no, but if you look at like this, so, and also that's one dimension, like you, like you mentioned. Okay, you have the power struggles going on, in the Middle East, and you have also various interests playing out each other in order to gain as much influence as possible. But then you also have the other dimension, like I mentioned. World leaders are gathered in Jerusalem, symbolically, in, in a symbolic city that is reserved for the Jews, and it's their part of their national identity. And you have people like Mike Pence, you have people like Putin, you have Macron, and everyone saying, we will do everything we can to fight anti-Semitism on a global basis. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so uh, obviously there is a power structure that is quite strong, because I have never seen that they organize, let's say, a conference in Riyadh and we're gonna oh we're gonna fight against Islamophobia everywhere there is an aggressive basis. We have not seen this yet. It might happen, but not not yet. So so we need to take this this fact into consideration and see what will the repercussions be. Because if you just look at we see a stifling of free in, in regards to free speech, anyone who is critical, let's say, of Israel and the Jewish state, or who goes a little bit too far, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that I agree with this, but people that tend to go too far, they're very reductionist, and they put the blame everything on the Jews. Will they risk being shut down on social media platforms? They, you know, they risk being, they're marginalized, they're, they're demonized and so on. But then you have other people that, that still are able to operate within certain boundaries. And for instance, they might be critical of mass immigration and so on, especially against Muslims. Well, they're able to freely operate and to express themselves. They're giving a platform, even though it's quite limited as well on their part too. What would you say about this? Well, it's certainly true that the that you you really are you're destroyed if you say anything against you know Israel. You you know I, I talked to a person who ran for the Senate here in the United States some years ago, and uh, this person told me that uh, the one thing that they that she was told when she ran for Senate was that you can never criticize Israel, otherwise you don't have a chance of winning. Um, and. That was that's sort of the advice that politicians are given in the United States. You don't criticize Israel or you're going to lose. Um, I think uh, I think maybe Patrick Buchanan didn't follow that advice when he ran for president uh, 20 something odd years ago on two occasions. He ended up not doing very well in the end. But but um, uh, it's, it's it is interesting. I mean, obviously, the 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 Jewish influence in, in the United States is, is very powerful. They're a very powerful lobby, of course. There are other powerful lobbies here as well. Uh, they're not the only one, but they are definitely powerful. And, and of course, they have, if you, it, when you look at World War II and the way, you know, all of us, everything that we do in the world uh, in, of politics is mediated by, uh, by stories about the past, about history, about myths, whether they're true or not, these myths become extremely important for the way we talk about the past and the way we talk about the present. And um, the, the persecution of the Jews and the, the killing of so many Jews in the Second World War became a, a very powerful 
understanding of people about what totalitarianism uh, of signifies. Course. Of course, and, of course, and yeah. I want I want to make I want to make a statement here that many people that were targeted, they, they were very poor Jews living in Eastern Europe, especially in Poland. I believe that Poland had, I believe, up until I believe three yeah. million people of Jewish descent at that time, and so on. And many of them lived in very had they were very poor, so they were not, let's say, rich and so on. But what I want to say yeah. is. Another uh, interesting, when we discuss, and I want to take this, I want to make this very clear. For instance, when we discuss the power of the Jewish lobby and so on, I'm primarily talking about the top tier position within this Jewish establishment. And it's, it's for instance, you have one aspect is the Israel lobby, let's say APEC, that is a very powerful lobby, but you have other lobby groups too. But the point of power, let's say, if you see you had this conference, the World Economic Forum, that had its annual gathering in uh, in the Swiss town of Davos, and it's a gathering for many influential and powerful people. And if you see those people that were present there, let's say, for instance, that represented the United States, uh, you had people like Stephen Schwarzman, who you had people like. Uh, you had various types of very like you had Jamie Dimon from represented the J.P. Morgan Chase. You had also the um, what's his name um, uh, the fine uh, the how what is his name. The name slips me now from he is the finance man. He is handling the finances in the United States. What's his name? Do you, do you have him? Uh, handling the finances, you mean he's the, the Secretary of the Treasury? Yeah, Secretary of Treasury, I believe. Oh, I'm, I'm not blanking on the name right now. Uh, yeah, it's Stephen uh, Mnuchin. Stephen Mnuchin. Okay, yeah. Well, he was also president at the Davos and so on, and, and, and this is... And, uh, and so was uh, Donald Trump. No, uh, Of course, of course. But 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 what I'm saying is that with all these powerful people and all of them, let's say, for instance, this guy, uh, Stephen Mnookin, I think his name is, he worked for yeah, right. Mnookin, yes, he worked for Goldman Sachs for many mm -hmm. years, I believe. Which is, by the way, many of our tre Treasury secretaries have gone through that route. Of course, of course, of course. But if you look at also people like Ben Shalom Bernaki, that was the chairman for the Federal Reserve Bank and so on. And so you have these top tier and many of them. And also that I mentioned in the previous discussion, you had like Paul Singer, the hedge fund manager, who is very, let's say, well known, a very ruthless hedge fund manager. And then you had like uh, Bernard Marcus and this ty tycoon, like I mentioned, also Sheldon Adelson. And then you had also this man that, that, that does not live anymore, but he supported the Trump, Irving, Moskowitz, and so on. And many of them are very pro, they are Israel firsters. That is that they, they want the United States to put emphasis on the Israeli security above all. And this is something that I try to explain that how, how are, let's say, how, how is this establishment so successful in translating the interest of, let's say, of the United States in doing so? Well, naturally, because it's, it's through the enormous amount of power. And, 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 and I'm not saying that it's everyone. It's not every Jew. It's not, I'm just explaining that it is a very strong Jewish elite that is in position to, to influence let's say, certain policy, but certainly not influence everything. That would be very, let's say, simplified to say something like that. Please, go ahead. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, you would expect people who are Jewish to support Israel. That's what you would kind of expect. Um, the, the question is, is that, you know, uh, look, as an American, when I was a kid, uh, you could only be a citizen of the United States. You couldn't be a citizen of two countries. And so I'm shocked when I find that there are Americans who are citizens of, of the United States and of Russia or of the United States. That isn't how our founding fathers conceived of it. Because we are a nation where 
consisting of immigrants from other countries and of different national backgrounds, this is not a good thing for us to have dual citizenship, right, for a country like ours. Um, and I think that applies to Israel as well, to, to have immigrants, you know, uh, to retain their national nationality of the country they came from and to come here and have American nationality on top of it. Um, yeah, is that that's the that's the um, that's problematic in my opinion. I was kind of sh surprised that Fiona Hill, who works for the National Security Council, apparently retains her British citizenship. So it's like, wait a minute, we have people who are at high level in our security establishment who have citizenship in the UK or Britain or other countries. This is not, I, I don't like it. But here we, we, we have this difficulty now in this age where you have uh, too many people assuming new nationalities like never before, especially here in the U.S. You have this huge immigration into Europe. I mean, I can understand, um, uh, you know, a Bosnian Muslim moving to Germany, you know, when he's two years old and growing up and thinking he's German. Right. And maybe having some confusion about his identity, whether he's German or he's, you know, to what extent a German can be a Muslim that. But but, but you see the thing, oh. which is, yeah, I mean, obviously, this is this is a confusing thing. And um, uh, this is what we get ourselves into in this modern setting. Now, now, here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, can we all be? one world citizens of the world or is that is that really a fantasy and if it is a fantasy we've got to say hey we've got borders we've got nations let's be proud of our nations and let's be for our own nations and our nation's interest not to hurt other countries or anything but just exactly to, you know keep everything straight keep everything honest oh. and above board um because, oh yes, of course, yeah. and uh, many many nations they're they're entitled to their self determinations. Like for instance, the Israelis, the Iranians, and so on. I think they all should be, you know, they all have their rights to for self determination and so. On. But what puzz what worries me if you have these these top tier people everywhere, you know, in power and shaping and creating the conditions for a next world war and so on, it frightens me a lot. And also it, it, it might create a huge disaster and so on. So that's why it's, it's very important to ventilate on those topics that we have discussed. But I think we covered it quite well, Jeff. I mean, I, I think uh, I'm very happy for you. Is there anything more for this session? That we, is there anything more that you want to add or are you fine? Oh, I just would say that, you know, I am concerned about the, the crisis in the Middle East getting worse. And I think that it's, a, it's right now, it's an Iran versus the U.S. kind of thing right now. And it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm hoping that it's, that it's going to be resolved without a major blow up, but I'm very concerned. And I think the signs from Russia are that, that something is, is coming at us, it's coming toward us. And I am, uh, I'm again, I'm, I'm going to be really relieved when February 4th comes and goes and there's no problem. Okay, that's going to be a moment of relief for me. Okay, well, well uh, said. Well, uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to this channel. If you like this, please make sure to hit that like button. Make sure to subscribe and please leave us a comment. What do you think about the discussion that Jeff and I had? I always appreciate comments and so on. And it's, it's, it's very important to get your take, what you as a listener uh, has to say, have to say. So, uh, Jeff, thank you so much and looking forward to speaking to you again, okay? Okay, thank you. Great.